Welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Mitch J. I'm here with Chandler Clubs, George Ortega, David Joseph, and Trick Slattery. Today, we're going to discuss wishful thinking and personal biases, how these get in the way of objective, rational thought, right? So on, on this program, we often discuss very controversial, provocative issues. We make statements about the nature of reality. But as human beings, you know, we have... Um, we have biases. There are things that we want, that we strongly desire, that prevent us sometimes from getting to that objective truth, or at least from fairly trying to ascertain what the truth is. So I thought we could, um, and this is especially applicable to the free will issue, because um, for many free will skeptics, we have this perspective that compatibilist free will believers, those who think that determinism and free will are sometimes compatible. Somehow you can still have free will despite the truth of determinism. Compatibilist free will believers appear to be engaged in a great deal of wishful thinking. They believe that human beings are more special than they really are because they want them to be more special. So um, I'd like to start and perhaps we can go around where we could all say some of our personal uh, some things that we strongly desire that may get in the way of our objective uh, investigations. So for me personally, um, I am a, a realist, a naturalist, a physical materialist, whatever word you want to use, I'm very grounded, I'm to the earth. I have a, I have a great appreciation for science and for mathematics, and I am naturally very skeptical about any kind of phenomena that is not well understood. So for example, if it comes to ghosts, for example, I not only do I not think there is sufficient evidence for ghosts, but I don't want to live in a world, in a reality where ghosts exist. I don't want that. So that could possibly influence me in a negative way if I am trying to honestly investigate what some people like to call the supernatural. Mitch, I don't, did you grow up with like Casper the Friendly Ghost? <laughs> I did. <laughs> it just makes no sense, right? Because ghosts are so, because the perception of ghosts usually is that they're these intangible ethereal things that can't be detected. That's the usual perception. Like there's no good way to detect them. That's what makes them so difficult. The, the standard scientific instruments aren't good you know it's, it's also the, i guess it's also there's an extension of this when it comes to ufos where people talk about i saw a flying saucer but the footage is always grainy it's always blurry it sounds ridiculous and that strongly probably affects me in, in that such a manner anybody else want to chime in here uh yeah actually i want to respond to the whole casper the friendly ghost thing as a matter of fact because basically um you know, when we have our ideas of what a ghost is or what a ghost does, like in my case, the idea of a ghost comes from the movies or cartoons I've seen of what a ghost can do. And so a ghost, you know, will look white, will look transparent, can walk through walls because it's like you can like you can like in the movies, you can see it. But it's like it's just doesn't apply at any rules like gravity doesn't apply to it. It can fly. And so. I, like, I would like to be a ghost and be able to do those things, you know? Um, and so that's an interesting thought is about how we get our ideas of what a ghost is. And that influences whether or not we would like to believe in those things. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I certainly, yeah, go, go ahead, George, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, if, if, we're, if we grow up kind of like with this idea that, you know, ghosts aren't necessarily, like, for example, like, when I think of an alien, okay, I, I definitely, you know, I guess we have a bias or just like, it seems like we can't be the only source of life in the universe. And But when I believe, think of aliens that have contact with us or could potentially, I can only think of aliens that are much more moral than we. I, I can't conceive of like, you know, just, you know, evil aliens. So, um so yeah, this 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 evil good thing I think has has something to do with it. You know whether how able we are to accept something. 
Well, I grew up watching Scooby Doo, so I don't believe in ghosts. <laughs> but, um, but I'm familiar with the old um, like alien thing. Um, it's, I think it's, it's, always... more, it's, it's more David. of a, a wishful thinking. Uh, I think on my part. Yeah, David, yeah. Cause... David, it's always the guy running the amusement park, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You've got to be wary of that. But um, yeah, with aliens, it's, um, I think with me, it's more wishful thinking. It's the idea that, that someone or something more intelligent can kind of come down and you get like a shortcut to being, to being smarter in a way. You know, you get their technology, you get that. Yeah, yeah. You get, you get their information, you know, they, they pass it all down to you. You know, who knows how, maybe they can just you know, telepathy or something like that. You know? Right. Well, David, I mean, with my kind of like understanding that, that you know, probabilities um, kind of like suggest that there would be aliens, it, it, it simply comes from from the math that, you know, like the, the likelihood that we're the only life force, you know, in the entire universe. But, but George, life. do you want aliens to exist? Um, I don't, I don't feel a need for aliens i guess because i'm a theist you know i guess i um any kind of like a an assistance from a um a being or an intelligence that um that might be able to help us i guess i would attribute that to god so so in that sense um now wait a minute would i want i mean like i think it'd be the coolest thing in the world no but do you want do you want because you want to focus on like do you want um, it's, sufficiently intelligent aliens to exist. Do you want that to happen? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's a it's a requirement or. A, a I'm not asking if it's a want. requirement. I'm asking, do you want that? Would you no, like... I don't think there's a. An, a Would you a, prefer an... a reality where there is a really cool, advanced civilization similar to humans, or more so? Would you like that? Again, um, just arbitrarily it it you know since it, they wouldn't have an effect on us there wouldn't be any interaction it wouldn't matter either way well, that's I, not really... I wouldn't i wouldn't want it yeah this so should that, be an that's easy my question. bias be pretty that's easy my bias question. i i would i would i would hate it I, I i would prefer that evolution only took place on the earth and that's it if evolution took place other in other places in the galaxy i think that would be a horrific i i don't think evolution was a good thing so i so for me my bias is yeah i would not want aliens aliens existing but that doesn't mean that they don't so I, and i understand that i understand that there's a likeliness that it's possible that creatures did evolve somewhere else that wasn't on the earth i want aliens to exist and i can explain why <laughs> because i like the idea that there could be life forms out there, some of them much more intelligent and more moral than us. Of course, they could also be worse, more immoral, or less intelligent, but it's hard to know. I just like to think that there would be some intelligent race of aliens that would do things better than humanity has. Yeah, right. yeah. That, you, but you, I don't think you, it would. I was just going to say, you don't want Klingons, you want Vulcans. You don't, yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. You, you, because those are the warlike Klingons are more warlike people. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. So yes. in regards to their personal bias, um, so some people say, yeah, they they would like aliens to exist. I say I, I would I, I would hope that we're the only planet that has that evolution has taken place on. So 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 how that kind of plays into our, I guess our beliefs in the idea is, is kind of important because for for me like I I I look at um, uh, those theories of, of why you know aliens might be probable, and I kind of I kind of do look for the problems with those specific theories because of my I guess my biases on that a little bit. Um, they they kind of lead me to look towards you know a little more stringent uh, facts about those specific uh, theories of you know con of aliens existing. So when it comes to sense? the issue, yeah, absolutely, got it. When it comes to the issue of God, for example. So if we honestly examine reality and we see all the pain and suffering, even from people who have some kind of nuanced religious, I don't know if religious is the right word, but George has, I mean, just today, he, you described yourself as a theist, right? So you're open to that kind of language. You, you would regard yourself as a theist, George? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know if, okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, well, we do that. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, well, I don't know if pantheists in general like would like the word theist or not i don't know i don't know if all pantheists 
agree. But anyway, like, we're going off tangent a little bit. So be, because of all the pain and suffering that exists on this earth, that in itself does not mean God does not exist. However, what it does mean is that if there is some powerful thing, whatever it's, what, I, I don't know if it's a physical thing or whatever it is, whatever this entity is, it's definitely not good in a manner that I would consider to be good. Or at so least for, all good. So for, Or at least not all good. So for example, right. the gods of Greco-Roman mythology, those gods that have very human-like personalities and desires, sexual desires, violent desires, jealous desires. And sometimes these kind of adjectives are thrown in in the Old Testament, but in a very contradictory, in the Bible, I should say, in a very contradictory way, because supposedly God is supposed to be all wise and all powerful and all good. So that's kind of strange. But, but anyway, the point is those kinds of gods, the Greco-Roman type of gods, they actually fit. They actually are compatible, no pun intended, with the reality that we observe. Like it makes sense if you mean, gods... You mean like the mythological gods? Were the mythological the gods. I'm saying yeah. based on the pain and suffering that exists on this earth, one could make an argument for why those kinds of gods are the true gods, given the fact that we don't live in a utopia, given the fact <laughs> that, you know, some people pray to one god to help themselves and help their family and not help alone. The, the way reality is, I think um, one could make an argument, I don't think it would be a strong argument, but one could say, this is the type of god I believe in. Oh, the Christian god, obviously that's not true. Gods aren't completely good. Gods are fickle. And gods are jealous and hateful and angry, but that's how reality is. It so, could be so. How possible. does this come back to biases? I guess is the question. Yeah. We're, we're so, kind of talking yeah, yeah. about biases. So I just kind of want to get get us back on track on that. So, what? How does the that that idea come back to that? I guess. So yeah, how does this relate to bias? So the the, the point is that is a that is a uh, a possibility, right? So when, so so I describe myself as an atheist mainly because. I am uh, very skeptical of the Abrahamic faiths, of the popular, um, uh, the popular religions on earth, and I sort of dismiss the other ones. So I am dismissive of uh, Greco-Roman mythology or Norse mythology because of my own personal biases. I would not want to live in a world with an evil god, and I think most people understand that. Pe most people don't even entertain the thought of an evil god. Of course, there are exceptions. I'm sure we're all aware of certain religions and cults where evil gods are worshipped. But the vast majority of humankind is so biased against the notion of an evil god that they don't even consider it. You know? Right. That's exactly. true. So that's, so that's one place where, it, where personal biases uh, definitely manifest in terms of religion. How do you guys feel about... Uh, your religious be beliefs or, or lack thereof. What I like to say about this is I, I, I tend to agree with what, what Mitch said about because of the evil and suffering in the world, um, I guess um, I'm personally biased against the idea that, it, what, that all of this suffering was orchestrated and part of some plan by some powerful knowing being. So I suppose that the problem of evil is exactly what leads many people to atheism. Again, the issue actually isn't so much about the existence or lack thereof of that God, but it's about a bias that, well, that thing, if it exists, is not all good because it causes suffering. So that personal bias confuses the issue and makes people think that the debate is about the existence of a said being, which part of it is, but also it's about, well, we don't want to think that there's some being out there who's planning out our lives in a fatalistic way. Because I do think religious belief leads to fatalism in that way, because you, it's like a god has willed your suffering, and, and you're not powerful enough um, causally to overthrow that power that's causing your suffering. So I think that my personal bias against that type of fatalism is what makes me less likely to believe in the existence of that type of God as well. Right. I, like I recall, we had, we had conversations, I've had some private conversations with George where he said things like, well, I want to believe in heaven because it makes me happy. Do you recall that? 
George, well, I absolutely, I do believe, I cultivate that belief. I, I don't, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't try to like get into the details of it. But yeah, that, that belief is, 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 is the best that I can think of. I'm, I'm not really sure. What do you mean it's the best that you can think of? I'm not really well, think, consider like any kind of belief we might have. The belief that after we die, we all go to the most blissful place possible and spend the rest of eternity. I can't think of a better belief. I mean, right. In terms, yeah. I, I agree. It sounds great. But I'm saying that's obviously just an open bias. You know, that's just just absolutely no, so, no, no evidence that I, you know, can, you know, rely on. Absolutely. I would I would like to respond to that. What George was saying there, because, you know, I mean, on the surface of it, it would seem like the belief that everyone after they die goes to some blissful existence of happiness, heaven or whatever you call it. But at the same time, I mean, I would seriously um, like to, I mean, I feel like that would make a difference. If that were found to be true, that would make a huge difference in our behavior now. I mean, because it would almost be like, well, why would we stop the killing of people if we knew that that would bring them bliss in an afterlife? That's a good point. Well, actually, but Chandler, the reason we would stop that is because when people die on this planet, the people that are left behind suffer. Right. So friends, find family. a way to exterminate all of them so they all experience yeah. bliss. Well, there exactly. you go. <laughs> uh, this, is, this has come up. I mean, I've heard of, of apologists get really angry when logic is presented to them in, in, a, such a, in, in, a, in this particular line of reasons. So the, the atheist or agnostic, the person who's skeptical about religion, says, you believe – that children at a certain age, and it depends on the denomination, the Christian denomination, okay, perhaps, um, you believe children at a certain age, let's say under 10, if they're killed, automatically go to heaven. So logically, let's just kill everyone. And then the, the, the theist, the theist, when confronted with this piece of logic, gets very emotional and angry and says, oh, you're belittling the issue, blah, blah, blah. That's a ridiculous, that's a horrible thing to say. Well, it's not a horrible thing to say. If you truly, truly believe, if you think it's true, that everyone will go to this blissful heaven if they don't live, if, if as long as they die before a certain age, we should make sure we kill everyone before they get past that age to ensure they have an eternity in heaven. That's, there's no argument against that. So, this is, so these are some of the problems that, uh, that occur. Like, George, I mean, what if reality... What if in this life, after you die, you experience torture forever? What if heaven is real? What if heaven isn't false, but hell is real? Like, it's possible. That is a possibility. But it's a possibility that people, most people, don't, eat, don't even entertain because it's so, um, it, it's so hard to handle. Well, no, you know, we most don't even theists, entertain that kind of possibility. Mitch, most theists, I believe, um, believe that. They're, they're scared to death of that. No, 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 but I'm saying, no, no, I'm saying that they think there's heaven and hell, though. Very, very yes. few theists think right. there is just hell. Some believe <laughs> there is just, many believe there is just heaven. Many, many Christians, in fact, depending on the denomination, believe in just heaven or paradise, like Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses think when you die, you just, if you're a bad person, you just get removed from existence. And if you're a good person, you live on in paradise on the earth. That sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> Jewish people have this idea of like Gehenna, where after you die, you're sort of purified and cleansed, but there's no hell. Right. And they also can't imagine that, that God could be a deceiver God. So, so they read whatever their book, their, their Bible, and they say, this is the truth. This is what God has given us. But yet it could be the case that God dece is deceiving them. Right. So it could be he could be a deceiver God, but yet they can't. That, that's something right, they don't psychology. entertain that possibility. Right. right. They don't entertain that because of, of the bias that you said. So. All right. So I would so I'd like to connect this to um, free will belief. OK, I, I strongly I think there's strong evidence to show that compatibilist free will believers want something special from people. They want to they want to feel in control of their own lives. And they will stop at nothing. They will, they, will, they, will, they will be relentless until they can find some way, some sophisticated way, as they sometimes um, would describe it, of explaining why human beings have some sense of control. So um, 
Daniel Dennett, for example, name that comes up pretty often. Uh, I want to find the exact. I'm actually looking up an exact quote here. Also, Daniel Dennett is you know one of the most. He's one of the four horses, and we've talked about him a lot of times. One of the the new atheists. One of the guys who wrote um, popular, powerful books about rational thought in the post 9/11 era. But when Dennett is not talking about uh, atheism or uh, or objectively using science and logic to criticize religious beliefs, he's talking about free will. And he is a compatibilist, the guy who thinks that, one who thinks that determinism and free will can somehow fit in with each other. So here's a quote from his Erasmus uh, essay. This was a prize that he received. Uh, and this is the essay, Sometimes a Spin Doctor is Right. So he says... Um, we don't want our children to become puppets. If neuroscientists are saying that it is no use, we are already puppets controlled by the environment. They are making a big and potentially harmful mistake. We both share the doctrine that free will is an illusion, is likely to have profoundly unfortunate social consequences if not rebutted forcefully. So this is an open admission of wishful thinking. This right. quote is Dennett literally saying, I am scared to death of living in a world without free will. And these neuroscientists, these people who are scientifically, logically coming to this conclusion, we have to rebut them forcefully. It has nothing right. to do with the truth. Notice he's not saying this is the truth of reality. He's saying whether or not this is the truth, I really, really don't want this. And I'm really scared of the consequences. Right. So do you, do you guys think that compatibilists in general, um, wittingly or unwittingly, echo the sentiments of, of Dennett? I think they do. They tend to say, oh, well, people will behave immorally if, if, peop if they're told they don't have free will. So it's an argument from adverse consequences fallacy is what they're doing. Interesting. Yeah, I, I like that. So I don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable mentioning uh, – a particular compatibilist that we engage in by name. I don't know if he would like yeah. to be called by name. So let's let's try to avoid his name. We can just say M or something, or use some sort of uh, some sort of placeholder. But yes, um, many of us have, ha have had exchanges recently with a very passionate um, compatibilist free will believer. And uh, this particular uh, compatibilist believes his. I mean, I think I'm pretty comfortable with his um, with his stance. I'm sure I'll invite him to correct me in the future if there's any mistake, but he thinks that biological organisms are special because biological organisms have a sort of purpose, that they, they have a purpose and their purpose is to reproduce and to thrive and to survive. Whereas um, um, other, uh, other things that exist in reality, things that we say that are not real, things that don't have, things that are not alive, things that don't have biological processes, or reproductive processes, they lack a purpose for this very reason. So M would argue that rocks don't have free will because rocks don't have these biological components to survive and thrive. They're at the will of the universe. They, are, they must succumb to the whims of the, their environment. Whereas human beings and perhaps some animals, um, by, by, by possessing biology, possess free will. And of course, this is just absurd, right? I mean, I mean, I mean we are carbon-based life forms. We are made of atoms. On a smaller scale, we are made of quarks. There's nothing special about having biology. Also, um, the same uh, compatibilist believer, M, he said that um, on many occasions that we must ignore physics. We should only look at the biology, and we have to ignore the physics. So if this isn't a clear indication of wishful thinking, I don't know what it is. It's saying I'm afraid of looking at the world through this lens of physics because if I do, I might find out that there's an objective truth that con that um, conflicts with what I believe. What do you guys think about that? Um, all right. Well, Mitch, um, here's so let's say we all agree with that because that that makes a lot of sense I'm, I'm not sure there's anything we could say um you know to refute that then the question becomes um you know these you know dennett they they need to believe what they believe because they're afraid of you know the alternatives 
then I think our challenge becomes to to calm their fears, to show them, no, you know, after after the world gets the you know free will is an illusion, morality is not going to collapse, civilization is not going to collapse. Let me just stop for one second. I want you to continue that train of thought, but I have a quote now. This is a quote from uh, from M, our compatibilist. Living organisms have purpose and will and freedom. And if you try to describe their behavior in terms of physics rather than biology, you will lose the ability to cope effectively with reality. <laughs> there you go. Right. So, I mean... And he doesn't seem to understand that biology is a subset of physics, but... but yeah, you know. and it's an open admission. It's saying... If yeah. we look at physics, we won't be able to cope with reality. It's like, hey, this will be scary. Let's not do this. I don't care if it's true or not. Let's avoid this. Let's try to use, let's just look at ourselves biologically so we can pretend like we have this sense of control. I am just right. going to ignore physics. And this is the same thing with Dennett. You know, Dennett's definition of a free will worth wanting is the power to be active agents, biological devices that can respond to our environment with rational desirable courses of action, which I think everybody would agree people do. You know, we, we, we deliberate on things and we rationalize and we're biological devices. <laughs> so, so I, I think don't... the key word in that definition is desirable. <laughs> right. Well, no, yeah, people act on desirable courses of action. Yeah. So, so yeah, his definition, if, if we apply his definition, that free will, his, his free will worth wanting exists but but what he does is he disregards the the fact that we couldn't have done otherwise so so it's these it's these otherwise notions or or the the idea that there's only one possible um future if, if we're looking at determinism for example um so he, he deny he just doesn't he looks past these things and he disregards them and that's the problem i see and and it's it's this disregard because he's concerned over what these other um abilities that we don't have, if people understand that we don't have these abilities, the consequences of what will right. happen. If, and we've if... talked many, many times about this. I don't know why it's so difficult for people. Well, I think, I think what people are afraid of is not, is how the layman will react. People are afraid, compatibilists in, in particular are afraid. Those, those compatibilists who we all agree are secretly free will skeptics. They're secretly hard incompatibilists or hard determinists, people who reject the notion of free will. I think we all agree that many compatibilists, deep down, if they were being honest, recognize there is no free will. Right. But, but they are afraid that the layman, the average person, will not be sufficiently informed about the issue because, I mean, let's face it, right? In reality, most people are not sufficiently informed. Most people don't really understand climate change. They know a few tidbits, a few sound bites, a few catchphrases. They've, they haven't read the entire article or read an entire book. They haven't done independent research. They have a certain amount of faith in experts and have their own personal biases and opinions and have little bits of information that they put together. Right. So there's this fear that most people, society at large, can be convinced that free will doesn't exist but won't be able to investigate the issue fully and come to the conclusion that what that means is we should just treat people better. What that means is there's no reason to be fatalistic. So this is, this is the fear, right? The fear that society at large, after rejecting free will, doesn't see the consequences, even if we free will skeptics do. And you know what? I find that highly immoral because it's basically saying, well, people are ignorant, therefore let's keep them ignorant. That's what it sounds like to me. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. And again, the other thing is like, you know, here in the United States, 80, 90 percent of people believe in God or higher power. So, yeah, the other thing is, and I've encountered this, you know, to a good extent in the meetups and discussions I've led. When people realize, when theists realize or come to, you know, the understanding there's no free will, it's pretty inescapable that God becomes culpable for the most horrendous ev evil. That's, that's, you know, that's tough for them to cope with. Except that it's not difficult because God doesn't have a free will either, remember? <laughs> now, 
I've got a, I've got another example, a really a really great one. There is a philosopher. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Stephen Cave. Are you? I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He has a really great TED talk that he gave not too long ago about wishful thinking. This time it's about death. So people, most people, um, as I suggested earlier in the podcast, want to live forever in some manner. They might not want to extend the life they have on Earth because the life they have on Earth might suck, but they might want a better life that goes on after their physical bodies have decayed or decomposed or whatever. Right. A, a better kind of existence where they still retain themselves. They still feel like themselves, whatever that means. But they get to live in a reality with less suffering and, and more pleasure. So Stephen Cave gave a TED Talk about... Um, the four lies we tell ourselves about death, like the four different ways that people want to extend uh, their lives. Um, I'm not sure if I remember all the methods. I believe it was elixir, uh, reincarnation, the soul, and uh, if I can find the last one, uh, one second. Are you guys familiar with this talk, by the way? Never heard of it before. Sounds familiar, but I don't. I'm not sure. I watch a lot of uh, TED talks, so. Oh, this one's a resurrection. Okay, so that's the idea. So those are the four of them. It's the resurrection, elixir, uh, soul, and um, I just lost it again. Reincarnation. No legacy. It's elixir, resurrection, soul, and legacy. So legacy, for example, would be the idea that. Um, if they build a monument and if stories are told about you, if you're in the record books, right? If you're in the record books, you will live forever. No, you won't. Even if people are telling stories about you, you have gone. You have passed. You are dead. You are no longer around. Of course, elixir is the idea that you drink some magic potion, right? Resurrection is the idea that you do die, but then you're brought back. And the soul is the idea that you do die, but you get to live in a different plane of existence uh, somewhere else. And this is not just about religion, believe it or not. It's also about science. Some people think science can allow them to live forever. And I guess theoretically, if we master uh, stem cell research, it would, and we could somehow replenish stem cells and stop them from ever deteriorating over time, theoretically, it's possible that we could live forever. But, yeah. but even but before we even knew about stem cell research, right? people thought science could offer something. Yeah, there's also a, a TED talk by uh, a woman named Tali Shiro, um, who talks about optimism bias. Basically, people, uh, the majority of people on the planet have optimum bi optim optimism bias. Whereas, if you give them the stats, the, yep. the actual stats for, for example, of the rates of cancer, um, their ch their the likelihood of anybody on the planet getting cancer, if you give them the stats of that, They'll always see their own position, their own, like if they, if you when when asked, what are the, what's the chances that you can get cancer? Their their percentage will always be less than what the stats show for the majority of, of the planet get actually getting cancer. Even even when you tell them what the stats are, so even when you tell them this is what the stats are that of anybody on the planet getting cancer, they'll they'll give that you at a lower assessment. So people have these biases, and they're just kind of built into our psychology. Indeed, indeed. So here's the funny, here's the funny thing about Stephen Cave now. When it comes to death, Stephen Cave is obviously a man who is not afraid of death. If you watch this TED Talk, you'll see how solemn... Uh, is Jamie there? I think Jamie's in the background. I think we can hear some typing a little bit. Jamie, is that you? Yeah, I think I think Jamie just joined the call. Um, we heard the typing, and it's usually Jamie doing the typing. How do you know, uh, Jamie? Okay, we'll just try to ignore it, I guess. But if he could, <laughs> if he hears this, if you could mute the the mic. Right yeah. Um, yeah. So Stephen Cave, when it comes to death, he's obviously trying to get us to rid ourselves of this fear of death. You know, death is not—I forget who said it—but death is not a part of life, right? You live your life. There's no reason to fear death. When your life is over, it'll just be like before you existed, right? You weren't alive before you existed. You won't be alive after you exist. So 
Stephen Cave clearly is trying to get society off their um, their um, their obsession and their fear of death. So he does not engage in wishful thinking when it comes to that. He does not think he's going to live forever. But when it comes to the notion of free will, surprise, surprise, Stephen Cave is a compatibilist. Here oh, is yeah? uh, yes. <laughs> here is um, another quote I'd like to provide. I guess we're doing a lot of quotes today from a recent uh, paper that he that he's uh, put out about the free will quotient. So this is about- that. So this is this notion of partial free will. Some compatibilists like to push this idea. They say, okay, uh, you, they say, okay, hard determinist, hard incompatibilist. In many of these situations you describe, there's no, the person doesn't, the agent doesn't have free will. Some people don't have free will. But some people, in some situations, do have free will. So this is really an extension of the notion of partial free will. And here's, so here's what he says. As we start to understand and learn to measure the capacities that underlie behavioral freedom, we can begin to put this natural free will on a scale. Hi. Is that Jamie? Everybody there? Uh, Yep. Okay, let's start that over. That was kind of weird. Go ahead. So quickly. As we start to understand and learn to measure the capacities that underlie behavioral freedom, we can begin to put this natural free will on a scale. Paralleling the measurement of intelligence, we could call it the freedom quotient, FQ. Such a scale should give us new insights into the factors that hinder or enhance our efforts to shape our lives. In other words, FQ should tell us how free we are and how we can become even more so. So this is a deliberate deception. It is a deliberate construction. He's saying, let's construct this thing. To f- let's construct this idea, this free will quotient, so we can measure exactly how much free will we have in certain circumstances. Right. Yeah, I've, I've read that article. I, I was like, what? Free- <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, it's absurd, really. It just shows a a lack of understanding of determinism. That's that's all it shows. Of right. cause and yep. effect. Yep. So so yeah. So basically, even the most unbiased person on certain things can be biased on other things, and and we see that with this person, right? Yeah. So um, he gives an example at one point of some animals, and. Um, There's a test to perform. So some experimenters perform a test to figure out how long an animal can resist uh, getting a treat in return for a larger reward. So if you don't take the small cookie, you get the big cookie. So we measure how long it takes for an animal to resist this. And what he's arguing is that those who take longer <coughs> before they opt, before they lose their patience and say, you know what, I don't want the big treat. I'll just settle for the small treat. They have more free will. Right. Obviously so, not. It doesn't so basically, matter. Yeah. I have no problem with with any of like like of what he says regarding regarding this stuff, except for his term free will. So basically, that's where where the, all the of the contrivance comes comes in is is him assigning the term free will to these faculties. Basically, these faculties are probably important scientific understandings for you know for other things, but. But it's it's the fact that he signs the word free will means that he's he's got that bias, I guess. Yeah. So he says he goes on to say to support what you, uh, what you've just said. This is what a lot of compatibilists do, right? So compatibilists right. say, "Hey, look, I'm talking about, when I say free will, I'm not attacking determinism. Determinism is just yeah, obviously cause and effect. That's the way the universe works. Right. But there's still something. There's a, a particular phenomena we're tri- phenomenon we're trying to describe." Related to decision making. But if they truly just mean that, there's a whole host of terms that they could use instead. For yeah, example, like, you can say you have a will, but the will isn't free. What were you going to say, Trek? Um, no, or just say decision making. I mean, decision making. I mean, decision making itself, you don't need free will for decision making. It's just 
decision think, making. That's, yeah, think, that's what these apes are, are doing. There, there's there's certain degrees of de- decision making capabilities that you know. So right. I don't know. It's the idea of this mysterious self that is doing it and can control itself and pick one thing over the other. That is the the falsehood that free will skeptics are attacking. I think right. George. Other terms. I think George likes. Um, political freedom. I like voluntary action. I think Sam Harris has also used voluntary and involuntary actions. But basically, we're trying to describe... So you have your will. You have this desire, these urges to do something. And it comes out of nowhere, it seems. Suddenly, one moment, you want vanilla ice cream. It just comes up, the thought. And there's an urge for you to get vanilla ice cream. You don't control that. So it's it's irresponsible. <laughs> well, maybe I should avoid that kind of language it's pretty it's illogical to say that um the will is free it seems a real misnomer to say your will is free when your will is bound by determinism and when thoughts and actions just pop up from someplace else before they come into your conscious mind and certainly sometimes you're reaching out for the vanilla ice cream you want to get the vanilla ice cream and you successfully get the vanilla ice cream Now, you didn't control your desire and you didn't control your body, but you did get that which you wanted to get. You felt for some reason you wanted to get the ice cream and you got it. So that that kind of situation is what we call political freedom, a voluntary action, whatever. Sometimes you reach for the ice cream and someone handcuffs you. They stop you from getting it. And sometimes we need... uh, words to help us describe these situations. We want to make a distinction between when you do what you wanted to do and when you're stopped from doing what you wanted to do. But none of that gives any sense to the idea of uh, of free will. So what about when you reach for the ice cream but Mm -hmm. you decide not to have it? Well, Well, then again, okay, so let's say so so let's say you had this thought, right? You had this thought, I want ice cream. And then your body started reaching for it. Then you had another thought, I don't want ice cream. You didn't control either one of those thoughts. So, so people, right. like to, people like to think, oh, when I deliberate, when I have one thought and then another thought comes up, that's where free will is. I think Michael Shermer has described it as free won't. So he said, and others like him, he's not the first to say it. Right, um, and, that's, and that's what this other guy was that you were. What was his name again, Mitch? The, Stephen Cave. St- yeah, that's what he's talking about when he says free, uh, free will quotient or something like that. So basically, yeah, if if you go to the, go to reach for the cake, but then think, oh, I, I you know I'm trying to lose weight, maybe I shouldn't have the cake, and and you bypass that desire to eat cake, for this other thing that you want, then then he he would call that some kind of free will quotient, but. You know that that's mistakenly right. thinking that that you could have chosen the cake <laughs> rather than choosing to you know try to lose weight. So well, here's an interesting thought, guys. Now, when a person using uh, Mitch's uh, ice cream example, when a person wants the ice cream and they get the ice cream, they say they use their free will to get the ice cream. When a person wants the ice cream but some other desire trumps that desire and then they don't get the ice cream then they still claim that they freely willed it. So I, in either scenario, they're still claiming it was their free will. So no matter what happens, they're still going to claim that they did it, and it's their free right. will. Well, some of them claim the second one, the, the second order desire, the one that trumps the first one, is is a more free option. So that that's where you get to these ideas of Absolutely. more freedom, basically. What about third order desires? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. yeah. Some, some even have that. Third order. So, yeah. so here's the, the bias and wishful thinking of Stephen Cave. Stephen Cave is not afraid of death. Stephen Cave does not desire heaven, or at least not as much as other people do. We can, I think there's strong evidence to suggest that, given his TED Talk. However, Stephen Cave does strongly want a sense of control and does think that human beings are special in a certain way. So he is engaged in wishful thinking and is unable to see contradictions. Here's another quote. So I'm going to take a little piece and then fast forward. Mitch, but wait a minute. Mitch, well, hold yeah, on. Mitch, we, I mean, we get this. You, you've, done, you've made your point. Yes, th- this wishful thinking and bias thinking right. is, is 
making people unable to understand that they don't have free will. Yeah. Now the question again, but but the what what we need to understand again, we we all agree with you. We understand this, but how? What do we have to do to get them to overcome their wishful thinking biases? We need to educate them that they're having the bias to begin with, <laughs> which is the hard part. Yeah, okay. I, so, do you want me to answer? Or, I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you guys would like to go around or something, I feel. Well, I mean, this is the problem, right? This is why we're here, trying to get people to overcome their biases, right? So um, so I think, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to really focus on the consequences, Really honestly try to illustrate to people what society would be like, what a society that has rejected free will would be like. I think an- – so another goal I think is we really have to clarify the terminology. I think – I mean not I think. I think – I keep saying I think, but it is, it is clear. It is a certainty that there <laughs> is no universal standard in terms of the terminology surrounding the issue of free will there just is no clear standard there are all kinds of words some people say human freedom when they're talking about free will modern day philosophers many modern day philosophers still say this in fact even in stephen cave's article he is using a variety of terms all right but again, are Mitch, not the Mitch, standard you're you're, so, you're 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 now describing how people want to retain the no 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 no, no, no George, I'm, by, I'm by trying to answer your it. question. I'm saying here's what we need to do. You said what needs to be done. Here's what needs to be done. I think we need to create an honest, clear vocabulary when we're talking about the issue of free will. We need a standard. We need a. Rigor. We have that. They they don't. No, accept I, it. I disagree. I don't think we do. I I do not think we do. I mean, George, even with during the course of this podcast, we've said. We were trying to describe a particular uh, situation, and I said there are many words for it. Political freedom, voluntary action, freedom of action, etc. There is no standard. So people are constantly trying to convince themselves of what the terms are, first of all. So I, th- I think if we could get all philosophers, no matter what their stances are on the issue, to first come to an agreement on the terminology, then we could make some progress. All right, but Mitch, I mean, like... Um, all right, the, word, the term free will, as, as like coined by Augustine, is refuted by Spinoza and Einstein and all. You know, we have a very clear understanding of what that is. It's like, you know, freedom. I strongly disagree. For example, Stephen Cave in this article says that people have free will is not all what right. people say. I hear it. you. I hear you. But like what, what I'm saying, I think what we're dealing with now with in relation to wishful thinking and bias is that they are unable to appreciate, understand, accept the standard, you know, centuries-long definition no, but George, because George, of here's, some here's, irrational uh, yeah, motive. George, I, I agree to some extent of what you're saying, but here's what I'm proposing. I am, I'm proposing something novel here. I'm saying, honestly, is there a standard? I mean, let's think about it. Yes. I, go, I, I disagree. I could go online right now, go to five different... Uh, authoritative sources on philosophy look up the definition of free will and they are distinctively different i could go to several different compatibilists look at their definitions the terminology they use it's all different i could go to the free will skeptics use the definitions that they use they use different terminology i mean even us amongst us the free will skeptics on this i program, i would disagree we i mean all like, use you- we, we, have, you, no, we have the same idea, me, but we use very different to, language. You go to, like, the standard dictionaries and the standard encyclopedias, and over and over, you'll see uh, free will is the ability to act unconstrained from, you know, factors or agents or influences over which we have no control. For example, you know that, the, the compatibilist we, were talk, we spoke about earlier, M, he says that free will does not mean freedom from causation. Mitch, I get that. I get that the compatibilists and people that are writing, that are writing, you know, in defense of free will. But George, will, that's gonna... what I'm saying. I think we're on the same side. I don't think you understand what I'm saying. No, what I'm saying is, Mitch, we need I understand to what you're saying. I understand what you're a saying. Universal but... glossary Mitch, of terms. Mitch, listen. Um, it's not that we don't have a clearly defined term. We do. It's that the compatibilists are unable to accept it 
So they'll change it and conflate it and confuse it. I disagree. I, I, I don't disagree with all what of do you, that. What, what do the rest of you guys think about this? I, I think that, that for the most part, there, there's a definition or, or a, de a similar definition that has been the standard throughout the histor history of the, of the philosophy of free will, basically. Um, and that compatibilists have purposely changed that and that's their purpose of, is trying to change their definition to something else of, of free will worth wanting, according to Dennett. So, so now that they've they've go ahead and, and they're trying to make these changes to the definition itself, I think we have more ambiguity in the process. So, so, so I kind of agree with Mitch there that that there's a problem of ambiguity now with when when we went, mentioned the term free will, with you know to anybody that they can confuse all these different types of definitions that are out there right. now. I, I, I understand that there's confusion. It's like with climate change, you know, all this stuff. But, but the idea, then the question becomes, um, how do we deal with it? I, I don't think that we can come up with a more accurate, clearly defined description of free will. You know, well, I think the well, way... Well, George, just to interject here, it's not, I'm not just talking about free will. I'm not saying free will... Is, hasn't been defined properly. That, that's not what I was saying, right? I'm not saying just the free will term. I'm saying all the terms in the discussion, not just, I think free will, I think, as you and Trick have, have just said, that one, it's pretty clear. It's not really that difficult, but I still, I still think we could do a better job. I'm talking about other words, other words involved in the discussion, such as freedom of action and political freedom. That's the thing. While trying to argue for the existence or non-existence of free will, yeah. many other terms come up in the discussion, and that's when the discussion doesn't get anywhere. Yeah, because I think this is a, this is just a problem in, in philosophy in general, basically, yeah. where where you need to define to find your terms, and then when there's two people using terms differently, you need to clarify your term. If it, if you thought it was an obvious term that you didn't need to define, then you need to both define your terms and say, okay, well, which one are we going to go with, basically? Yeah, um, you know, I think Mitch has a point because all words, not just the term free will, there's no two people on this planet that are speaking the exact same words and meaning the exact same things by all of those exact words. I think that's sort of an inachievable goal. So it's we have a limitation. Well, it is achievable in science, in mathematics. It's achievable. It can It is achievable here as well. But Guys, it's not being the, done. The, it's, the it's achievable in philosophy. The compatibilists that define free will in terms of like political freedom and all that. Do you do you seriously think the ones who who, who write books about this? Mm -hmm. I mean. Do, do you believe that they, that they don't understand the, the meaning, for example, of political freedom? That it, it's like, you know, that it's not fundamental, it's, it's like societal, it's, it's consensus-based and all. I think I mean, there is definite confusion on the terms. I think, it's unav I think no, no matter how intelligent you are, if you right, don't so have what, the what standard... What is confusing? What, what, what exactly, for example, about political freedom do they not understand? Yes, so... Well, there's, there's all kinds of things. For example, so, so what you'd call political freedom, right? I would call a voluntary action, for example. That's the same kind of thing. It's doing, it's be, it's doing what you want to do. But of course, you don't have free will because you don't control the want, right? But some people will hear the word voluntary <laughs> and will be very confused by the fact that I just said a voluntary action. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't define it as voluntary action. I think it's See, like the word. So yeah. So obviously, the word voluntary is the problem. The word voluntary. Well, the word voluntary is only a problem if you're not sure what voluntary means. But if I define voluntary action as that, as doing that which you want to do, you have a will, a desire to do something, and then you act upon it. That is a voluntary action. So whether or not you like the word, if we can start somewhere, we can get somewhere. You see, that, that, that's, that's the point. This is what is missing. Other people will look at the word freedom and get really, really confused by the word freedom and engage right. in this circular confusion, this semantic cloud based on the words we're using. We need to force 
all philosophers, <laughs> all scientists. No, seriously, because this, this is what happens. Yeah. In math. You can't but even in your science, you can't do that. I mean, you can it's try. You can do it. No, you, you don't know. what are you talking about? And science forces mass times acceleration. You don't get to pick. For F equals M. Yeah, but, but, but in peer-reviewed papers, there's, there's words all over the place that aren't defined, and they're, they're, they're ambiguous words. So, so we have the pro same problem in, 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 in science that we do in philosophy, basically. Is it, you, either you define your words in the peer-reviewed paper, you, know, you, you define each and every word that, you, that might have some ambiguity to it, or, or you have these problems with... Uh, well, we don't care about each and every word, right? We just care about the keywords. I agree with you there, but there are keywords, and there's a limit. There's a finite number of keywords that we need to address. There are not that many. There's about 20 of them, maybe, that keep on coming up in this discussion that we really need to tackle and get a standard on them. Yeah, and that's a good once, idea. Yeah. Try, try to look for a lot of the keywords, like 20 of the main keywords, and then say, okay, these are the semantics, or just kind of go over the, each of the semantics for exactly. each of those words. Whether All right, guys, let me, let me, let me um, pose a question to you. The people who are redefining it, you know, in different terms, right? Do you believe they're redefining it because they don't, do not understand the standard definition of free will? Some of them Again, do, not just the don't. definition of free will, but the terms Forget about associated the in the discussion. Mitch, Mitch, follow me. Um, you're not, you know... Um, the question is, are they resorting to these other definitions because they don't understand the, the standard definition? It depends on the person. Uh, most of the, I, th I would say most of the compatibilist philosophers, the, the people that are actually philosophers that are compatibilists, probably do know the other definition. They just kind of bypass it. They, they disregard it. Right. Um, well, some, that's... Some, some of them don't. There's, there's um, Frankfurt, for example. He, he understands what it is. You know, he, he, he actually, actually uses the otherwise notion, the um, possibilities notion. But, but he says that we still have moral responsibility, even if we couldn't have done otherwise. So, so, so some of them do go to that line. Uh, most compatibilists don't, don't go to that Frankfurt line, and they, and they, they just redefine free will altogether. But it depends. Because, like, I mean, you know, going back to the theme of bias and wishful thinking, I mean, we want to establish whether they're not getting it because they have these irrational biases that are preventing them from understanding something that's relatively simple or because they're not understanding it because of conceptual issues. You well, know, well, George, that, yeah, yeah. But, George, you posed the question. Exactly. I mean, right, this... The message of this show is about wishful thinking and bias, and we've sort of transitioned naturally into the free will issue. First, we talked about some other things, uh, God and ghosts, even Casper, the friendly ghost, Scooby-Doo. And we, we came to discussing compatibilist free will believers. George, you posed to me a question. You said, what can we do? Well, what I'm suggesting is the first thing we should do is get a rigorous language here. Let's get a glossary. Let's get a universally recognized uh, grouping of terms. That way, for whatever reason, the, the compatibilist may be confused by the definition, or the compatibilist might be trying to evade the words. But either case, regardless of why the compatibilist is creating these definitions, if there is a standard, he can't evade anymore. Well, the no, that's what... can no longer evade. Mitch, no, if, I mean, if he's beholden to the standard, because Mitch, then Mitch, he... there is a standard. The standard. No, 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 no George, I don't think you understand what I'm saying here. I'm not talking. I, I do Once understand again, what you're saying. I'm saying. saying Mitch, anytime... Mitch, come on, let hold me... on. Let, let me clarify though. Let me really. Oh, clarify. Can, can I just say something real quick? Well, I, I, George, you're, you're, I, you're right that there's a standard for free will, but I think what what Mitch is yeah. saying is even. I understand even if... what he's saying. I understand, but what I'm saying is like just as there's a standard for free will and they don't agree with it so they don't accept it, if we create other standards for political freedom others, they'll do the same thing. Well, well hold on. Let's not come to conclusions. And, and, who, and who are we? I'm saying, if, for example, if, the, if right. the international body of philosophers, if in philosophy they go, look, we have these issues in philosophy, right? I mean, Trick is the philosopher amongst us. He knows about the mind-body problem and so wait a minute. No, no. I mean, I, I understand this. Why are you cutting? Hold on a second. Give, please give, give me a moment, please. 
so there are all these kinds of issues, right? And even though philosophy is often seen as a very subjective uh, <laughs> sort of realm in academia, right? There is a goal. There's usually a goal in mind, even if opinions might vary. I'm saying, what if the philosophical community itself decided, look, let's systematically, rigorously break down these terms. Let's get these terminology. Let's get, let's agree on this is will. This is what would mean for your will to be free. This is what an action is. This is what, I, it, and get I a think, standard for that. I think it might, might be a little bit of wishful thinking in there, Mitch, because I don't, think, <laughs> I, I don't think people are going to do that. Like, I, I don't think there, there will be a standard ever in, in philosophy. There, there's but just so many if, words. If you, if you want to solve this problem, but, but again, it's we, not that. We could, we could define, we could, we could make a whole list of words, define them all, and say this is what the standard should be. You're yes. going to get about 50 different philosophers that are going to say, we disagree with your definitions. You don't know so, yet. How do you, you don't oh, know until you try. If, oh, we try to be as it, open, but... if we try to be as open as possible and right. remove any kind of bias. Well, I, that's I totally agree with you. We have to define, for, for our position, we have to define our words. We have to say, these are the words we're using and these are our definitions. Right. And if we don't do that, then, then that causes the confusion. Right. And... I'm suggesting that, free will, that believers and skeptics alike, free, free will believers, free will skeptics alike, come together to agree upon these terms and break them down. So, how so you, how do you propose to do that, though? How do how do you propose to, to get them to all come together to do this? conversation through writing, through conferences, things like that? Hold a con. Yeah. In fact, I'm inspired to do something after this show. <laughs> after this well, I'd, I'd like to see. That it would be a, it, it's a it would be a good trick to do. I mean, it would be quite a task. Let's put it that way. To yeah, yeah, to okay. get... yes. There's a point I was trying to make. Yes. Yeah, so earlier, um, when I was having that little back and forth with George a few minutes ago, uh, and I, a thought occurred to me. I was gonna. I was going to say, anytime I read an article, or I watch a lecture, or I read a book related to free will, the author creates his own terms every single time. Every, it's, there's never any kind of standard from either side. There really isn't. So George, you might argue that, well, the free will we're talking about is pretty clearly defined. It has been clearly defined since Spinoza or whatever. Fair enough, but I'm like I said before, I'm not just talking about free will. I'm talking about the words that we need to determine if free will is a meaningful, coherent thing, if it exists or not. That's what we need to do. We need to not avoid the necessary language to discuss this issue. We need to pick accurate terms. So yeah, George, long-winded way to add to your question. The first step we need to, need to do is we all need to be talking about the same thing in a rigorous way. To well, stop. Let, let, listen to, to, I'm ahead. sorry, George. Had, George had something to say. I thought on this. George, didn't you had something to say? Um, no, I said it before that that oh. basically what's preventing them from understanding the the standard definition of free will will likely prevent them from agreeing upon or understanding these other kinds of like you know variations or, or things that aren't free will like political freedom you know i i think that this is like as we started out more of a psychological biased motivated reasoning based problem they they don't want to accept that we don't have a free will because of the implications not not so much because of the terminology no but george i agree with you i completely agree with you however having a clear universal terminology will prevent some of that evasive behavior because they will be forced to confront the contradictions in what they're saying at this point in time because there is no standard they can play semantic games but i want to yeah. be able to stop the semantic games and then we can find out who is just biased and who was confused well one one way i suggested like with dennett um you know, I think he's admitted in a few articles that, yeah, we can't, things aren't really up to us, but we have a free will. Exactly. Right? So, so, so one, one way we can do this is by focusing on that, you know, just focusing on the message. Listen, you know, it doesn't matter whether you call it free will, whatever you want to call it. The fact is that nothing is up to us. That, but I want that it to matter. Imagine, better. imagine if Dennett was forced when he made that statement. Imagine if he was forced as an academic, as a philosopher, because there is a standard in philosophy, to not phrase the sentence that way. 
what if it would just incorrect to phrase the sentence that way? There isn't a standard cool. like in, in philosophy. There's people that you know, you know, Dennett. Dennett believes consciousness doesn't exist. Galen Strawson will tell you consciousness is the only thing we can be sure exists or we can know exists. I mean, like in philosophy, no, there isn't this 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 general standard about most of the stuff. Philosophy isn't, you know, it's not like science. There's so many, like, you know, really unfounded, just, you know, irrational beliefs. Hey, guys, a few words about biases, because this is kind of our topic. You know, the very fact that people are unable to agree on any given word, this word means this thing. And the fact that they can't agree upon the very words they use to discuss things is an example of their personal biases that they can't overcome because these biases are driven by desires of which they don't choose, displaying the entire lack of control, lack of free will that we that we don't have, basically. Yeah, a lot of times when I get a compatibilist, like, post something on one of my blog posts, and I'll give, like, their compatibilist notion of free will, I'll say, well, that's not the notion of free will that I'm talking about. I'm addressing this definition of free will. So, so I'll, I'll say, yeah, we have that type of free will if you want to call it free will, <coughs> but we don't have this type of free will, and that's what's important for these other reasons. That's so exactly all, it. So imagine if they were forced, compelled, to not say free will. They could not call it. It would be just wrong. <laughs> it would just, you would not allow to saying that would just be completely wrong. Yeah, but then you're just taking away the ambiguity of words, and, and I don't think that's possible to do. I, I, I just think that's a task that's just not going to happen. I mean, but. guys, this is kind of like debates about the existence of God. I mean, the two debaters are almost never agreeing about what God is. And when you're not in even agreement about the term, it's like, how can you have a discussion? Yeah, that, that's why I think we have to focus on the reasons people are afraid to concede or accept that, that, that we don't have a free will. You know, there, there's fears. There's like really like unpleasant connotations, implications of this. I think that's what leads them to not understand the clear definitions of free will, to conflate and confuse and misinterpret political freedom and all that, you know, that I think that's the foundation we're, we're struggling against. Yeah, um, and we, David and Jamie haven't had a chance to say very much um, yet. Um, so um, what's what's your take, David or Jamie? You want to chime in? Um, about Jamie? What? Yeah, Jamie, I know you joined us kind of late in the podcast. Ted, do you have any thoughts on what we've been arguing about so far? <laughs> Um, yeah, could you um, remind me of what you were talking about? Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know how to, we've been talking for the longest time. I guess you haven't been paying attention, but. Um... Yeah, sorry about that. We're yeah. talking about wishful thinking and biases and how they get in the way of uh, objective, rational thinking or this desire to find objective truths. And we've, in the past half hour or so, I guess, We've been focusing more on compatibilist free will believers and what needs to be done in order to have some clarity in the issue. Um, and how Dave, to reduce to bias. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. please. I don't have anything to say, to be honest. <laughs> okay. How about you, David? Hey, David. Well, I, I was uh, I was just going to say that I agree with Mitch. I think you know definitions need to be drawn up. And people need to agree to those definitions. But with regards to what George was saying, I think there's a lot of ego and emotional reasons that are going to be kind of jumbled in there with, with what compatibilists will say. Okay. And Yeah, and you know, here since we're talking about personal biases, um, my personal bias that affects me is that I only want each word to have one meaning. Nothing pisses me off more than when I type in a word to my dictionary, such as free or good or any word like that that has tons of different meanings. Um, and there will be, you know, 10, 20, even 50 different definitions of one word because what that implies is that conversation is useless because with all these different de definitions of one word, it's like, it's like saying that 
um, like in mathematics, you know, numbers have to mean something. Five has to mean five. You can't make five and nine be synonyms and expect to have things add up right. You know, that's what um, human language seems like to me. Right. Yeah, I actually uploaded uh, a one-minute video on this uh, about a week ago. I don't know if I think Trick maybe you saw it and Chandler. I have. It was. Um, it, it was basically saying how depending on on what culture or subculture you come from, you're going to have a, a, a different meaning for the same words that other people are using. Right. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a bit like that. But when it comes to things like engineering and, you know, sciences, then, you know, th there's no confusion. If someone says this needs to be 10 foot long, then that needs to be 10 foot long. There's no confusion there. There's no misrepresenting the, you know, the information. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because if somebody said that a certain object needs to be 10 f feet long and then each person took the length of their own foot – and tried to make something that measured 10 times the length of their own foot, you would you would get a different length for practically every person. And that's what I feel like our conversations have become, is because everyone has different foot length, there's no definition on how long a foot is. <laughs> that's what yeah. it's like. A, a lot of yeah. this is just a, is a problem with language itself. You know, language has developed through, all, through many years and, and all the... All, tons of words are just totally ambiguous because of this, because of the way language has developed. So it's just not the most efficient uh, communication method. If, if there was some better language that just had more efficiency, then that would be uh, more accurate, I guess. But so that's why that's why it's so important to define words, especially ones that aren't um, common or, or something that people know. So that's why the first thing I did when I wrote my book was define the term free will. I, I had a whole chapter defining, just defining the term free will, of the free will that I was talking about in the book. So. Yeah, and I think that the actual concepts that people are believing in, whether that's the emotions they're feeling about something or an object, like, for, like let's just take a square as an example. Like, we know what a square is, you know. Uh, you know, four-sided regular polygon, you know, all sides are the same, all angles are 90 degrees. We know that concept. There may be different words in different languages used to describe that concept, but at least it is a real thing behind it. Whereas I think language has a problem and that it allows there to be words for something, even if there's nothing to back up those words, that those words aren't actually based on a thing. Guys, I, I you know, while I agree with you in terms of the um, ambiguity of language, I think this is far beyond that. Um, take, for example, um, evolution. Evolution has preponderous mountainous evidence in its support. I mean, like, you know, no serious scientist would, um, would doubt it or attempt to res refute it, yet over half of Americans, you know, do not believe in it. You know, I think we're, we're dealing much more with fundamental needs for for the world to conform to the way people need it to conform than with you know semantics than than with variations and meanings yeah some well some words are less ambiguous like uh geocentric or uh evolution tends to be less you know ambiguous but then there's some words that have a lot of ambiguity so yeah and it's it's interesting because um I, I think that this comes down to all sorts of discussions, like, you know, our idea of what a dog is, what a cat is, what a horse is, you know, all these different things, like, in general, people are able to agree on what these certain types of animals are, or certain types of shapes, and what a, how many a certain number represents, but there, I think we do, like Mitch suggested, we need to eliminate some of this ambiguity of words and have there be agreement of these definitions because even if free will was clearly um, defined other words used in the debates whether it's choice or responsibility or inevitability or these other words they all um, the compatibilists love to play with the ambiguity of these words and for some reason um, we haven't managed to stop that yet
Yeah, let, let's take take Dennett, for example. He had a whole video on how people shouldn't be using the word inevitability because, and then and he took, took out the I-N from inevitability, which is evitability, and he defined that as the ability to... Um, to avoid things. So, so he said, if you throw like a brick at somebody and they duck it, then it was evitable <laughs> or, or avoidable. So, so he's playing with the semantic of inevitable and changing it up to this internal, you know, if you throw the brick and you duck it, then it's evitable. Therefore it's not inevitable, but, but it's still inevitable in the sense that we're talking about, uh, which is, um, the future was not inevitable that you would avoid the brick. So, so he, he plays with words, and, and it's this type of, of I guess, people, philosophers that obfuscate language that causes all these problems, I would say. So. Yeah, and we are limited to using words, obviously. We're, we're talking on a podcast, for example. You know, we're, you, we're all speaking English, um, which is really cool that our friends in the UK are speaking English that's close enough to American English. Um, and that's really cool that we all have a similar agreement of language. But even still, um, it, there's, there's, we're limited because language can't um, be fully agreed upon by all of humanity, which is precisely what we need to happen. Why is it so surprising that <laughs> the people of the, I don't get the English thing, but I, I, I get the general sentiment I'm with you. But uh, yeah. So maybe uh, we should have another show at some point on on words. Maybe we should just talk about what words are we using to describe things for our, for these for this topic, and maybe we can kind of come to some definitions or something and have a starting point there, Mitch. Absolutely, sounds pretty good. Yeah. So, I, so have we discussed this thoroughly for today? Um, this, uh... Well, um, maybe. Was there any other personal biases that anyone wanted to share of how they're biased to where they have to believe a certain thing a certain way or anything like that? Um, I, I would say, like, as I alluded to earlier, I am naturally a, a skeptic. And the requirements I have for reality is I need rigorous deductive logic and I need evidence. You know, I, I think this is a bit axiomatic here. I don't think... Um, I think we've shown over time, just um, empirically, we've discovered over time through experience that the ways to find the truth are through rigorous deductive logic and evidence. Either you can argue step by step, this implies that, that implies that, and try to make the connections as strong as possible, or you have physical evidence that strongly illustrates what you're trying to do. We have the scientific method, we have mathematics, we have logic. So I hold, I have a certain standard. Before I can believe in anything, it has to pass a certain standard. And I'd like to think that my beliefs are very consistent in that manner. George mentioned a few moments ago that evolution, mountain of evidence from the genome, to the fossil record, to the diversity of life, to diversity of life forms, to all kinds of things. Okay, strong, strong evidence. And not only that, but it gives you predictive power. So using the scientific method, one of the things that really uh, empowers the scientific method, one thing that really gives it credence, is are the predictive models you can create. By using um, the theory of evolution, by using the idea of natural selection and random mutation, it allows you to do so much in terms of biology. So the reason why I'm not convinced that ghosts exist, so the reason why I don't think God, at least the Christian God, the God of Abraham exists, the reason why free will, free will is nonsense because free will is illogical to me, but this is a consistent sort of philosophy I have. I guess you could call this a bias, but perhaps it's the only bias that one should have if one is going to try to investigate things in a rational manner. We could say that there's both good biases and bad biases, couldn't we? Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, I think it's good to be biased in favor of wanting evidence for a claim. I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with that. I think you have a point there. 
Guys, I think I think definitionally bias, I think, would suggest that it's like a bias that's like counter to reason. Right. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, for one thing, obviously, we're all biased towards pleasure and away from pain. The hedonic imperative is the strongest bias, which we can never overcome. Um, but I don't think it's such a bad bias, you know. Well, no, that that's, you know, that's more of a drive. I'm not sure we could, you know, it's really a quote unquote bias. Bias really, you know, means that, you know, there's a certain kind of rational, realistic way of seeing things, but we are, we're holding our belief not based on that, but on some preconceived or um, premise, some, some premissory belief, so, some kind of ideology or need, emotional need that we have I that tend isn't, to, isn't I tend related. To... Yeah. to the uh to the um to the reason well i tend to simplify it a little bit and maybe you guys can direct me if i'm using this idea of bias wrong but i think a bias is just a very strong desire to believe or see things a certain way it really comes down to our desires and how we're unable to choose our desires we don't have control over our desires and so something else has to cause us to come out of biases or desires that are bad for us or others. Yeah, I, I think by most definitions, uh, a bias is just leaning in one particular way as opposed to another, being in favor of one thing as opposed to another. Yeah. I mean, often there's connotations about it not being reasonable. But, but anyway, as, as you know, I'm not really concerned about with what current definitions are. I'm more concerned <laughs> with with capturing ideas and expressing the idea. So even if the word bias is not the appropriate term, hopefully the idea has been communicated, what we're trying to express. This idea that what is, sometimes people talk about the burden of proof, right? What's the normal way to be? I think the normal way to be, the rational way to be, is to be skeptical. And then the burden is on the person who makes a claim to say, this is how reality is. And then you have to give me evidence. That person who makes the claim has to provide evidence that this is how reality is, as opposed to the way things seem to be. So, yeah, so I, I guess I am biased in the sense that anything that most people would put under the umbrella of the supernatural, I am very, very skeptical of it because the evidence seems flimsy, to say the least. Right. So basically, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan says. Sagan so. says. Well, does that? I mean, like that that's actually been one of the ways that um, paranormal skeptics have tried to um, basically deny paranormal more normal evidence. And um, that seems like um, an arbitrary, incorrect uh, criteria. I mean, like. For example, we have um, this entanglement, quantum entanglement. You know, theoretically, a particle at one end of the universe can communicate pretty instantaneously with a particle at the other end. That's, you know, I can't think of a more, you know, super extraordinary claim. But, you know, the, 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 um, the evidence for that isn't extraordinary. It's simple physics. It's simple experimentation. But it has evidence for it. No, no, right. But, but I'm saying, like, I was, I was focusing... So, so so I was focusing in. I was focusing in on the keyword extraordinary. In other words, like that's that's an arbitrary, um, unscientific. It's just the quote from Carl Sagan. Yeah. Like, no, let's no. Let's, let's, guys, let's, put was, let's, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If I trick, was looking well, trick, out my window right what now. What I was saying, trick. What I was saying was that when you apply that the extraordinary thing, it, it's not just Carl Sagan saying. Uh, it, what I was saying before is that when paranormal skeptics attempt to refute the findings, they will use that as the premise. They, they will say, well, you know, like, if if this was a, a standard scientific experiment, yes, the, the evidence for the paranormal exists, but since it's an extraordinary claim, okay. we need additional evidence. And that, that's it, just unscientific? No, no, not additional evidence. All, all it really means is, like, like if, if I say I'm looking out the window and I see a bird out the window, and I tell you guys this, you could probably take that and say, hey, you know, he probably does see a bird. He doesn't really have to prove it to me that he sees a bird. But if I said, I'm looking out the window right now and I see a UFO in my backyard, you guys shouldn't take that on 
you know, just me on the hearsay of me saying it. You should say, oh, well, we need further evidence of that. Right, so but that, that's, that's not, all it means. That's not what the paranormal skeptics are using. They're using two basic strategies. One is, you know, that the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the second is, uh, what is the other one? I don't know, but just, just that one alone. Again, it's, it's like, it's not about, you know, presenting something, you know, actually they, they have the evidence, but the, the skeptics require beyond what standard science requires. Oh, the, the, other, the, other, the other argument they use is like, and this is like completely unscientific. I mean, like, you know, I, I was actually communicating with Raiden over the last several weeks Say, you know, um, basically, there, there's work to try to get this out of science. Some scientists will refuse to accept evidence unless there is a theory that goes along with it. In other words, like if, a, if scientists will find something and they can't explain why they found what they did or the, the, the workings of it, many science, scientists will reject that, you know, lack of theory. So, again, the, these two claims that are used by skeptics for the paranormal. They're, they're not scientific, they're not rational. George, do you think, George, do you think there is strong, strong evidence to support any particular claims that are usually labeled under the umbrella of psi? Well, let me ask you something. Have you, have, Mitch, have, uh, let me ask you, uh, let me answer your, your question with a question. I don't have want you, to. Have you I'll read have you read a book by Raiden or any of the top Psy researchers? Well, I'll tell you what. You answer mine first, and then I'll answer yours. All do right, you think the, there is strong evidence yes, to I do. support yes, any of I've, the claims made? Yes, yes, do because think, I've read the books. Yes, because I, I've read not, the books I'm by the proponents. I'm not questioning whether you have read the books or not. I, that's not I, I was giving I you additional question. information. Now, have you read any of these wait, books? Hold on, guys? I, just, wait, hold on. Wait a second. Let's... Let's continue this, okay? Uh, s s secondly, no, no. Answer my you question. I, answer I will. Answer. I will. I will. Mitch, but no, is... no. Answer it now. Answer it now, and then we'll get to whatever you want to say. Well, this is just at the end of the sentence. Let me just allow me to finish the sentence. I just want to say that. Um, so when you say there's, because I just want you to clarify what you said. So when you say that um, you do think there is strong evidence, are you saying that evidence is like um, it sort of parallels the evidence for? Uh, evolution or cellular theory or atomic theory exactly See, yes you're empirical, saying it's that it's, yes empirical it's, evidence it's, yes well i'm not just saying there is evidence i'm saying now answer all evidence. right answer my question Mitch. yeah, yeah, yeah Have well, you... hold on well i'm just saying i'm not just saying there is evidence do you think the evidence is of the same stand yes same, yes i'm yes just exactly of the same evidence like yes. like, you, like you know how like mitch, with Jim mitch you're avoiding answering i'm not the avoiding I will, i'm answering will. yes it, it's it's of the same I just um, want you to quality clarify. hold on how, how more quality. how you know you, there's, you, there's, you don't no, you no, don't like one, my answer so give me, you, yes no, how more no, how much no, more clearly me, do you need it well if you let me talk you'd see how much clearer i've been letting you talk but like you you've been avoiding my question i'm not avoiding i promise you i will in fact i will give you five questions I just want to finish this. I just haven't finished the point here. Here's the point. You have. Saying, no, no, I haven't. For example, you know, like um, when we talk about the human genome and there's evidence. Yes. That says and the answer is yes. Wait, hold it's, on. Is that solid? Wait, 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 wait. What, you know, when it says like the, the human <laughs> genome when compared to the chimpanzee, there's like 95% similarity. Is there that kind of evidence? Side. Mitch, there's evidence like against there's evidence. Listen, there's evidence against chance in the billions and trillions. Okay, that that's substantial, you know, empirical evidence. evidence. What? Now, I'm not sure what you're saying. There's evidence against chance in the findings. In other words, like the 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 possibility that the results being chance instead of real are like in the billions or trillions right. to one. Can I, can I just okay. raise my no, hand? No, no, wait. No, no, no. Trick. Hold on. Now, Mitch, okay. you answer my question. Have oh, yeah. you read ahead, a book, any work by any proponent of Psy? Uh, book or an article? No, a book. I've read, art I've read articles. I've, I've never read a book by All right. Well, scientists. I'm sorry, but like, you know, basically, then when you make the claim that you have any no book. evidence, you were making the claim that you basically have not found, found any evidence of this that's credible when you haven't investigated it. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but, but reading, I, I don't, I, an article to yeah, but I don't have to read a book by creationists to, to debunk the fact that 
they, they disagree with evolution. And we're not right? talking creationism. I'm saying there's tons of books out there Sorry, that I guys, couldn't no, investigate, no. but I don't Unless have to read them. You're, you guys are like you. You guys are like you know passing judgment on something that you have no understanding of because you haven't read the, you haven't done the research. Well, well, to be fair, I'm not saying that I. I I mean, I sort of agree with what you're saying. I, I agree. It is fair for you to say, George, that I have not spent my time going through detailed investigations of um, Not even that. You sci- haven't even read a book of sci- them from theirs. You haven't even read a book. Come on. You, you haven't begun to explore. I haven't read a book by Deepak Chopra either. No, I'm not I, saying I, that. No, no Chopra I, is not uh, one of these guys. I'm talking about Raiden. Excuse and me? The guys Chopra who... is not one of these guys. No. Chopra, Chopra is, is Dean Raiden's they... best friend. Chopra is – no. Chopra, Chopra no. does not conduct this research. Okay? Chopra is well, like I, a, a personality. He, he does his stuff. You know, fair you're, enough. You're... Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, hey guys, but, why don't we talk this, about this offline? Because this is this is kind of we're totally off topic, I think, of our, our podcast with the size stuff. I think. Yeah, we are kind of off topic, but this is a great display of our personal biases. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's now, true. George that's true. And Mitch oh. have their biases, and they keep going at it like this about these other topics. But yeah, Mitch, would you like to um, close out this episode with a few final comments? Uh, if anyone has, well. Um, we've discussed wishful thinking, we've discussed uh, biases and how they get in the way of uh, a clear, honest discussion of important issues such as free will and God and science or psi and ESP. And, um, yeah, in, in, for the free will issue in particular, I think we can all agree that something has to be done to help people overcome these biases if we are going to live in a more empathetic kind of world. 